Any questions? algebra no problem there right it's a million therefore it's commutative and it's finitely generated therefore it's affine okay. so uh, if uh, M has no P torsion in case characteristic of k equal to p bigger than 0 okay then km is reduced this is the statement right okay so let's first reduce this to so m is a finitely generated abelian group so let's write a free part plus a torsion part. Right? Okay. So what will Km then be? Kf. So let, let let me let me call this F, let me call this T. We are answering a question from last time. Okay, the claim is this. Because we had said this is part of the equivalence of categories between finitely generated abelian groups with no p torsion on the one hand and diagonalizable subgroup uh, diagonalizable groups over k equal to k bar on the other okay. so part of that required this because if you started with this and then went here in general we saw how to make a group ring into a uh, half algebra okay even when it is not commutative when it is commutative, it is going to be an, a commutative algebra. When it is finitely generated, it is going to be an affine algebra. Moreover, if this condition holds, then we claim it is reduced. So, indeed, that will be an algebraic group. Uh, spec of that, spec of Km, will be an algebraic group because it's a half algebra and which is reduced as an affine algebra, as, a, as, as an algebra. Okay. So, this was necessary for us to establish this. Okay. So far, is this, is this good so far? What's this part? Okay. So, what does, what does this look like? Kt. Kt is a finite group. Right? T is a finite group. Now, um, if you have a and P does not divide the order of T exactly. So T is a, if you, so, so every representation, so it's semi simple. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to remind you if you take a finite group 
and the field has order uh, the, fi the field has characteristic that is not divisible by the rather field has order uh, characteristic that does not divide the order of the group then re representations of that group over that field are completely reducible okay so I, I, I okay I remind you of this so G finite group K a field assume characteristic of K does not divide the order of the group. Okay, then every linear representation of K of G over K. is completely reducible. This is the claim and what is the proof? The proof is averaging process, right? So what I am sure you have seen this. This is just, if th this is the same proof as when you prove that a finite group, complex representations of a finite group are completely reducible. It is the same proof. No, no change in the proof. If you go back and look at your proof, it will work here. Okay, the only thing that you do use is that, that the, that you, the, it is not divisible by the uh, characteristic of the field. Okay, so I'm I'm just repeating in a slightly different uh, language what you already know. Okay, so it's I'm not pulling something. I mean, this is you are familiar with this, except that you might not have it might have not have been put across to you in this in this language. Okay, okay. So the proof is, and the word the word is averaging. But no, you don't need. You don't need k equal to k bar here. For this part, you don't need k equal to k bar. What you need k equal to k bar to say, for example, that if g is abelian, then every irreducible representation is one dimensional. Th there you need. But for this, you don't need. Hmm? Um, so the proof the proof is averaging process. So what do we mean by averaging? So to say every representation is completely reducible means what? If you, so if V is a, let V be a representation and so let V be a KG module And um, right. So you, what you, I'm, I'm trying to prove that it is completely reducible. So. To say it's completely reducible, it means exactly uh, it's an if and only if condition that if whenever you are given a W, which is a sub, there is a complementary W prime. That's what you have to show. Okay. So um, choose um, any K vector space splitting. of the inclusion of W in it. 
again this is all this is something you've seen okay here are, I'm, I'm doing certain things which are uh, maybe not I'm not assuming these finite dimensional okay so I'm just uh, enlarging the you know the same proof that you know into a that it holds in a larger context okay so and semi-simplicity you know there, there are three equivalent conditions for semi-simplicity right of a module namely that it is a sum of simple simple modules that it's a direct sum of simple modules that every sub module have a complement okay these three are equivalent and it is easy to see in the finite dimensional case if v is a finite finite it, it, so you so we are talking about there is a underlying field always and you have an uh, let's say a group ring over this field of a finite uh, of a group if v is a finite dimensional vector space over k which is a representation of this group or in other words a kg module then to see that these three are equivalent is easy because you can induct on the dimension okay if you can write v as is equal to w direct sum w prime you know if if that is not irreducible that means that's not simple there is a sub and then you can split and so on but you can't keep on splitting infinitely because the dimension has to go down so it, it, this process has to stop at some time but if v is infinite dimensional you can't do this okay so some extra argument is required there but it is still true okay that argument is is quite uh, nice it's uh, it's uh, not so easy but it's the same statement holds okay so it may be a good thing for you to go read that up at some point okay so so you understand what this means what, what this means is that you take the inclusion of inclusion followed by pi is equal to identity of w this is what it means right it's a vector space map from v to w such that this holds now why should that exist well i mean you can take for example a basis of w extend it to a basis of v again we are assuming that all these things can be done and then you just uh, uh, you know set the other uh, basis elements to be zero put these two themselves okay so for example that's and you can do this in an arbitrary way okay we are not assuming anything about pi what we need to do is somehow make this pi modify this pi to make it a g map if you make this pi into a g map then the kernel of that map will be the complement okay so and we can do this by just doing um, consider g pi this is the average so what what we mean by this okay let me write it more clearly g pi by g pi i mean g inverse pi g what does that mean g inverse okay where is pi a map from pi is a map from v to w so g inverse is a map from v to v pi is a map from v to w and then last g is a map from w to w that's the way you should interpret it okay our abuse notation and write written just g for everything okay okay now can you now the thing is this is a splitting this is a, a commutes with all elements of g so this is a g splitting so claim the above is a G splitting. Right? So I have to what all do I have to show? I have to show it's a splitting. 
I have to show it's a G splitting. So why is that a splitting? Well, I can do so. So I have to take this. Right? Let's see, and then can everybody see this? Okay. So let's write G pi G inverse inclusion. Right, I've just expanded it. Okay. Now so I'm just copying it. Inclusion is a G map. Right? This is a G sub module. So I can commute that because inclusion is a G sub module. I can write this as G pi inclusion G inverse right now what is this this equal to because pi was chosen to be a splitting right now this is identity of W therefore now this G inverse these are all on W Right, when I commuted this, this G inverse of course is not, this G inverse was on V, this G inverse is on W. Okay, so anyway, these will, so everything commutes with the identity. So this G, what you get is goes away. Right, and it is a G map, sort of because I have averaged it. It is the see if you the idea is this is is very simple. If you take a sum over orbits, then that is a G invariant. If I have a finite group, you you take an element V, look at its orbit, it's finite. V, G, V, G1, V, G2, V, G3, V, etc. Take their, take the sum over all the elements of the orbit. If if we like, so assume V is living in a vector space, so this makes sense. That element is clearly G invariant. Okay. The reason why we need to that you don't need a one over G the, there to make it G invariant. You can divide it still be. You know, of course, you scale a G invariant element, it still be G invariant. Why you need to scale it is because otherwise it won't be a splitting. It is here that we use. See, this this thing was just an ornament up, up to now. It's only here that it kicks in. Up, up until now, until this step, this just came along for the ride. It is here, really here that it's this is kicking in. Okay, okay. So, so the fact that this is uh, so that's why writing it like this makes sense because this is just the orbit of pi under g okay it is so although it is this you should just think of it as the orbit of pi under g right where where g acts on see pi lives in home vw which is a vector space and g acts on the vector space and this g, g you know uh, these uh, this is the image you know this is the 
uh, yeah, yeah. this is pi acted upon by g and this sum is therefore the sum of the orbits of g, the you look at the orbit of pi under g and you look at its sum of all those elements that is clearly g invariant okay and therefore and 1 over g bar doesn't make a difference to it okay okay so uh, so if you want to do it formally so 1 over g bar g in h g in g g pi if i write an h here right to sh to show that it commutes with um, g what do i have to show that it is invariant under g that is g pi g inverse is equal to pi that's what i have to show so i have to show that this is equal to without this okay but that's easy because you know for if you want to think like this and then you can change since this is over all g you can just change that and write So that shows that it is a G map. Okay, okay, finally. Okay, well, <laughs> coming back to where what we wanted to do, what have we shown? We have shown that KT is semi simple. Right? The group ring KT, the algebra KT, is now a finite dimensional k space because t is torsion part of a finitely generated abelian group so it's finite so kt is a, a semi simple finite dimensional algebra now over an algebraically closed field now i use that so how does a semi simple algebra over an algebraically closed field look like you have any idea of this have you studied semi simple algebras at all no. No. So, um, okay. So one one if one um, theorem that you could quote, right, is the following. It's called the altin Medaban theorem. If you have a semi-simple algebra, then it is a finite dimensional semi simple algebra over an algebraically closed field is a product of matrix rings. Okay, so there is a theorem like that called Artin Vadabhan theorem. Uh, of course, it is more general than that, but I am stating it over algebraically closed fields. Right, you can, you can make this more general, you can take any field and then say use division rings, you can uh, use you can even give up the finite dimensionality and use just that it is artinian etc there are generalizations never mind the generalizations if you have a semi simple algebra finite dimensional semi simple algebra over an algebraically closed field then it's a product of matrix rings that is it is see this is the same theorem no more no less i mean uh, than when you say uh, the group ring over see you must have seen this theorem that uh, if g is a finite group then cg see cg what is g finite group is a is a product of matrix rings right you've seen this no have you seen this that cg is equal to this is the regular representation of you can think of it as a regular representation of g then it breaks up into okay i'll write one one step ahead of that v star tensor v v is in a, have you seen this no okay so okay you have not seen this Maybe you have seen this that Cg is equal to direct sum 
So this notation just means, this is just fancy notation for all irreducible representations of G. Okay. It actually means unitary irreducible representations of G, but here G is finite, so every representation is irreducible, we are over complex numbers. So, um, so this just means all irreducible representations of G. Okay, you can just take that. So then you know that this the regular representation, how does it break up? It breaks up as V, V is in G hat, direct some dimension of V. This you see. Right, each irreducible representation occurs in the um, regular rep right, right or left regular representation as many times as its dimension. Okay, so that is this statement. Well, this is a slightly more fancied version of that. The and it's actually the more natural statement rather than this. To see that, you, you all you have to do is look at it like this. C G the group ring is acted upon on the left and the right by G. So it is both a right and a left module. See here you are only considering it as a left module. But you could consider it as a right and a left module. If you do that, then it naturally, then this makes, this becomes, this sort of gets rationalized. It's, it becomes more beautiful and becomes this. So instead of this dime V, what you get is this V star tensor V. Okay, this is as a G cross G module. So this is as a left G module say. This is as a G cross G module. Right, um, okay, let's understand how this V is a left G module. If V, G acts on V, G acts on V star, right? Therefore, V star is also a G module. And as we have seen, if, if some A is a module for something, B is a module for something else, then A tensor B is a module for this, cross this, if, it's a, if there are groups, right? So naturally, this is a module for G cross G. On the other hand, this is a module, this is a G cross G module with G acting on the left and right. Okay, so this is a, so the action of G, say X, Y acting on G is X, G, Y inverse. You have to put an inverse just to make it an action. Okay, so just to make it a left action. So you have this, but then by some easy, this is end of V. Right, V star tensor V, you can identify with endomorphisms of V. Okay, so again, this is something quite easy, and you should. Uh, so, in general, if you have a finite dimensional representation, so W star tensor V is isomorphic to naturally. Um, w V uh, so W finite dimension okay in that case you have that you haven't if you haven't done this you should work this out it's almost the first exercise that you should do after you've learned tensor products of vector spaces So in particular, this becomes Horn VV, which is end of V, right? End of V is a matrix, and that's that. Okay, okay. Now coming back to your question. Okay. Here, let me ask you, suppose I, have, I give you an abelian group, 
right? I give you an abelian group. What does CG look like? Finite abelian group G. What does the group ring look like? Okay, so here is an exercise you should do. The group ring is just a product of C's. It's C cross C cross C. That's what it is. Okay, so uh, that's a special case of that's a special case of this. Right, you can deduce it from this in the following sense. If this is a product of matrix rings, but if G is abelian, then this has to be abelian, and the only matrix ring which is abelian is a 1 cross 1 matrix ring, which means it's a product of 1 cross 1 matrix rings. And therefore, it is one matrix ring times another matrix ring, so it's just a product of C. In other words, this is the same theorem as saying every irreducible representation is one dimensional. Okay, so there are many ways you can see this. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm just thinking. See, you've studied structure theory for R10 rings in Atayam McDonald, chapter uh, 9 or 10, uh, 9. Structure theory for uh, theorem for R10 rings, commutative. R10, he does it for commutative, commutative R10 rings. Structure theorem for, no, not quite. Okay, you didn't get that far in the book. Okay. Uh, Okay, so let me see what else I want to see. Uh, okay, how about I, I assign you this exercise and you do it and if not then we can discuss it again next time. So, right, so what I am saying is T is a finite group, abelian group. C T is then the group ring, right? It's a finite dimensional C algebra, correct? Now I claim this is a um, this is a product of C's. So how many C should be there? As many as the order of T. Right? Now, and if you look through this proof, the only thing that you will use here is that that the order of the group, the, the characters, the, you, know, you can replace C by any field where that does not divide the order of the group. Okay? So um, that will do the um, trick. Okay, so and therefore it is reduced. Okay, um, maybe there are. Okay, I will think about it. May, maybe there are even more direct ways to prove it. Okay, so we have to prove this, right? Instead of you know saying all this story, um, I could have just tried to give you just a direct proof. Okay, although that might be, I mean. This is valuable also, I believe, but uh, which we can try to do. Why don't you try to do this and I will also try to do it. How to just give a direct proof. What you need to use is that that the order, it's important that the characteristic does not divide the order. That's very important. Okay, otherwise it's just plain not true. Okay. You need to use algebraically first. You need to use algebraically. Uh, 
Well, well, let me see. Just to show it's reduced, probably you don't. But you may assume algebraically closed because you can anyway go there and show it's reduced. You understand what I'm saying? There is no loss of generality in passing. See, in assuming that it, if it is, if it's enough to show for it for algebraically closed. Because see, what are we saying? I want to show kt is reduced, right? Right? I go to k bar t and show that it is reduced. That's good enough, right? Because kt sits inside k bar t. Because, right? Correct? So, if k bar t is reduced, kt is a sub of that, therefore it must be. So, there is no, that, you know, you, you can assume it's algebraically. So, if, if, you, if it is not, for this you need it is algebraically closed. That is, even if it is not algebraically closed, it is going to be reduced. But it will not be a direct product of fields. Okay, any other questions? So I, I, I do appreciate questions because uh, we, I mean although it looks like we have just come doing three chapters rather uh, um, particularly the third chapter although it is just a few pages the material is really dense and uh, it uses lots of uh, stuff. So, um, the, you know, the, I'm not claiming it is trivial at all. So, uh, by all means, uh, do ask questions. Okay. So, should we then continue with uh, what we were doing? Okay. Okay, today we will prove something, another very nice um, uh, statement, what I was, uh, I, which I was talking about towards the end of last lecture, namely rigidity of diagonalizable groups. Okay, that is the statement. It is called rigidity of diagonalizable groups. So the statement is the following. Okay, I am tempted to again give you some intuitive idea. So let us look at GLN and uh, let me think of automorphisms of GLN. Automorphisms of GLN. We know some automorphisms, namely inner automorphisms. GLN acts on itself, right? And uh, although this action is not faithful, in the sense that the center of GLN will act trivially, but there is still a lot of GLN which is not in the center, namely. G so the the kernel of this morphism from GLN to automorphisms of GLN is really the, precisely the center, right? In any, in any, for any group that is true, right? From G to the automorphism under the inner automorphism, precise, the kernel is precisely the center. Okay. So, there is indeed a big, you know, GLN, GLN has order, has the dimension n square. It is an open set in affine in square space. Whereas the center of GLN is just uh, the scalars, scalar matrices that has dimension 1. So, GLN modulo its center will have dimension n square minus 1. Okay, so such, 
such a so there is a big group which acts non trivially on gln as automorphisms okay and it is connected because gln is connected and th therefore its image in the automorphism group is also connected okay however the point is if you take a diagonalizable group in contrast such as dn then this phenomena will not occur in the sense that if you have some group a connected group acting by automorphisms on this then that automorphism <laughs> is um, trivial that it so um, somehow uh, uh, and the idea of the proof is the following if something acts on a diagonalizable group it acts on characters and characters are a discrete set therefore something cannot act continuously on that right the, the, that's roughly the idea but you, you know you have to make this precise and it, you, you know uh, while this you might say is uh, you might even agree it's a proof intuitively you might say okay this is con convincing i i actually have a, seem to have a proof but so that's not quite uh, kosher because uh, you'll have to say if it acts then the action on the uh, chi star t is continuous etc there are some even so in this intuitive thing what we are saying is if you have a continuous map into a discrete set then it's a constant map right i mean from a connected set to a discrete set then it's a constant map this is what you are saying so from this if you have a continuous map from uh, so the problem is with establishing this continuity right so you will not be able to say precisely um this continuity part will be difficult to establish so that's why it is phrased in in this uh, slightly uh, strange way but really intuitively all this is going on is it acts on t therefore on the characters that's a discrete set there cannot there cannot be any continuous action on this therefore I mean, that's the um that's the proof intuitive proof okay so let g and h be diagonalizable groups connected a fine variety let v to form as algebraic groups from g to h be a map such that v cross g to h right v comma g goes to phi v what does where is where does phi v live phi v is a algebraic group homomorphism from g to h so i can evaluate that in g and get to h phi is a map is a morphism of varieties Okay, then p is constant. Right? 
that is all of V will go to a single it's a single homomorphism from G to H. Right? So if you the, in other words if you take if you take this homomorphism imagine this homomorphism from G to H. Right? So you if you try to move this in some continuous fashion <laughs> it won't move. This is what it means. There is no in here there is no you can't move it. See to, to move it what does it mean? It to it it is to have a map from some say variety connected variety into that right that's an intuitive notion of moving it right continuously and uh, this is a natural condition to what right? so it won't move this is the claim and okay before even we prove this let us um, do the corollary so that you see that it is not really a it's um, <coughs> it's not really a useless uh, it, in fact it's a very useful uh, um, and uh, very fundamental fact. Okay, um, it underlies the definition of the while group of a reductive group in the in in the in the linear algebraic group setting. Okay, so if you there is a definition of a while group, if you have a semi-simple Lie algebra, there is a definition of a notion of a while group. Here, what is the definition of the while group? It uses this theorem and in fact this corollary. Okay, what does it say? If H is a diagonalizable subgroup, of a linear algebraic group, let's see I need to state it this. then Okay, let's understand the statements. You have G is a linear algebraic group, any linear algebraic group. H is a diagonalizable subgroup. What does NGH mean? NGH is normalizer of G in H. Sorry, normalizer of H in G. <laughs> H in G. That is all those elements G in G such that G H G inverse is equal to H. G at G inverse is contained in H. Now is that a closed subgroup? I mean I intuitively agree that it is a closed subgroup. Okay. Do you agree that it is a closed subgroup? If uh, G H G inverse is going into G and you move G continuously I mean if something is in the closure of that that is also going to take H to um, H right um, so so when I say diagonalizable subgroup I mean you know, closed subgroup so that's 
He doesn't say that, but that's they're taking it to be a close up. So that is closed, and what does NGH0 mean? The connected component of that. Okay? So no, that's a close uh, subgroup of G, right? So it is a linear algebraic group in its own right, and you are taking the connected component of that. Similarly, GH, that is much easier to see that you maybe that you will agree much more readily that G, this centralizer of H in G, namely the all the elements which come commute with all elements of H. So that in particular um, contains H because H is diagonalizable so it is in particular commutative. Okay. And then again you are taking the uh, uh, connected component. These are equal. Why? This is almost trivial from this because you take your v to be this g to be g in that thing to be h and you have an action of this group on h by conjugation right you have an action of this group on h by conjugation now this is a connected group acting on a diagonalizable subgroup but what we have said here, the image is a single point, but then the identity acts trivially. So everything acts trivially. Therefore, NGH0 is contained in ZGH. But then it is connected, therefore it is image is in ZGH. Okay? So, acts on H by conjugation by rigidity since one acts trivially all the elements act the same way and how does one act? One acts Trivially, it sends every element of H to H. Therefore, every other element also sends that element fixes every element of H. X trivially on H. Right? So, which means, um, so, right? But then, where is the image? So, this is connected. So, and one is there. So, it must belong to the it must go into that since ng at 0 is connected Now let's see why that is true. Now uh, n g h zero is 
In fact, this is equal to I can write, right? You have that, right? What can you say about this quotient? Finite, because G mod G naught is always finite, okay? For any algebraic group. This is not true for a Lie group, okay? It's a, true for a linear algebraic group. The, it uses the Noetherian condition. This is finite. So this must be finite. This is an equality. So this is finite. So this is finite. This subgroup is contained. NGH is a group, and that its connected component containing the identity. Connected component of that containing identity. Yes. So every group, if, if I write G is a linear algebraic group, G upper zero means the connected component of the group containing the identity. Connected or irreducible component are the same. So, remember that the picture is always like this. Of a, I mean if you think of it as a picture of a group, linear algebraic group, it always looks like several lines, if you wish, where the number of lines is finite. That corresponds to the, so one of them, so if identity is here, so this is G naught, okay, and that's a normal subgroup. It's a normal subgroup of G. G mod G zero is finite, okay. and we have proved that. Um, what is that? G naught is um, minimal among closed subgroups uh, such that G mod. See, if the quotient is finite, then such a group must contain G naught. We proved that. Anyway, so is this clear? This follow you mean? Because so I have this big subgroup, a uh, big group. These are subgroups, but then this is equal to this. And this is finite because this is a linear algebraic group. Okay, so the, so in particular, this group this group is caught between. Yeah, it's a it contains a finite index subgroup. Therefore, it's a finite index. Okay. Right. Okay. So here is an exercise. Take g is equal to, or uh, h is equal to g. Okay, G is equal to GLN, H is equal to DN, compute NGH Makes sense, right? I can take any diagonalizable subgroup in any group and ask you to compute NGH mod ZGH. I mean, I can of course ask you to compute it, but 
what we know is now is that it is going to be finite right so what is this I mean this has nothing to do with uh, I mean, you can just treat this as a plain abstract group theory exercise so, uh, it's not uh, we are doing it in the context of linear algebraic groups but uh, you could have set this exercise uh, without any reference to um, linear algebraic groups just it's just an ordinary group theory exercise okay so so this is the definite this is going to be the definition of the uh, boil group in uh, in our in this context so if you g is a, i mean we won't reach this point but if g is a reductive group then the y group is defined by means of taking a maximal torus and you take normalizer of the torus divided by centralizer i mean modulo of the centralizer of the torus okay now of course maximal torus will now make sense right <coughs> maximal torus torus we have understood what is a torus it's a diagonalizable subgroup which with several equivalent conditions what are they let's recall them it could be connected, connected. if it's a connected diagonalizable group that's a torus or it could just be uh, uh, that, you know it could be isomorphic to some dn that's that's the same thing or another way of saying it is that its character group is a free abelian group okay finitely generated free abelian group so these are equivalent of ways of saying a torus so what's a maximal torus it's a maximal among uh, diagonalizable subgroups. So you call uh, maximal in the sense of no other group containing that, no other closed subgroup containing that will be diagonalizable. It's maximal among maximal with respect to inclusion among diagonalizable closed subgroups right so maximal torus is already making sense right maximal torus right so you take a reductive group whatever that is gln is an example of a reductive group is a prime example of a reductive group you take a maximal torus in this case it will turn out to be dn it's a maximal torus and then you take normalizer modulo centralizer that will that's called the weil group after harman weil okay so that will be used this uh, when you study structure theory of reductive groups this is how you define the weil group in this context Yes, it will be independent of the torus you take for the reason that all tori you will prove they are all conjugate by elements of G. They will all be inner. Mm, all maximal tori will be conjugate to each other. Okay, so they, they, it won't make a difference. So if you take this or that, you will this NGH and that N, ZGH you can just map this to that by the conjugating element so they will be isomorphic indeed just like if you did it in the semi simple Lie algebra case you define it with respect to a Cartan sub algebra there you prove that all Cartan sub algebras are conjugate by a, um, what is called the inner automorphism of the Lie algebra so similarly here it is you will show that maximal to right that is a theorem that is a theorem, one of the main theorems is that maximal tori are all conjugate in a connected group. Well, I need not say connected group because anyway, tori are contained in the connected group. So, okay, so 
let's try and prove the um, rigidity. Okay, let's um, so we have this, right? So I take the reverse map in on function. On functions. Um, by the way, do you think this affine is necessary here? It's not quite necessary. It is enough to prove it for affine. This this affine you can omit in the statement because. The way to do it is okay. Although you have not studied something, you don't have the definition of a variety yet. I claim you know enough to know that it can be removed because, as we have said, a variety will be patched up by affine varieties. So, if V is a variety, you can just apply it to one one piece of that affine variety, and it will be constant on that, and it will be constant on the on another patch it will be constant on another patch it will be constant on and just by that some topological uh, argument you will see that it must be constant on the whole thing ok. So, this affine you can remove <coughs> it is enough to prove it for affine and so we can assume this ok. What I mean is enough to show. Is the argument clear? See, what I am saying is, suppose we were not an affine variety, you restrict it to a affine part of that variety and you will prove that on that part it is constant, on some other affine part it is constant, on some all affine parts it is constant and then uh, you know it is a connected <coughs> variety so it will be enough. So, okay, let's take um, See the idea is you take H and G are diagonalizable. So this map characters span are in span or in fact are a vector space basis for KH. Right? So it's enough to that sort of tells you everything about this map. The image of all chi as I vary over all chi tells you everything about this map and therefore everything about this map. Okay. So, the idea is to look at chi okay, and write it and what does the pre-image look like? I mean what does the image look like? It is some element here and how do elements here look like? I can choose a basis for this. See, if you have say W tensor V, if I choose a basis of V, then every element I can represent as some W tensor one of these basis elements. Okay. Now, what is a natural basis to choose here? Well, I can choose um, characters because G is again diagonalized. 
Okay. Okay. One thing. Maybe I'll use Sai because in the book he seems to use Sai rather than Kai. Okay. So I I can write like this. So f chi psi are some functions on v. Okay. Okay. Now, for every now, let us specialize. Uh, so, uh, let us look at. fix v in v and consider this right now if i take psi here and uh, look at uh, what is this? Uh, I can look. What will that be? That is, I claim, that will be equal to just taking Natural to expect that, right? So this is a function on G, right? I, I psi v and then psi psi is a character on H. So this is a character on G. This is a homomorphism of groups. So this is a character, but then being pulled back under this map, I have this. Now, now, this is a character of G. So what can you say? Dedicant's theorem. So what, what does it say? For, so it is, exactly. it, it's exactly one, one of the characters it is sky and the other places it is zero. So what, so conclusion, Dedicant implies F chi equal to of V is equal to zero for exactly one chi, right? Depending upon V, let's say. One for sorry, that's what you were saying. <laughs> I didn't realize. Okay. Zero for all others. Okay, so now what he is suggesting is let us look at so. Thus, uh, can I erase this now? Thus, so look at f chi psi right it's either 1 or 0 for every v right so f chi psi 
He says he, square is equal to f chi sub. Okay, this is maybe. So, what have we shown here? We have shown that this taken at v where v is arbitrary is 1 or 0. Right? Now, never mind if, if it is this or this, its square is itself and independent of v. Okay? So, you have this. Now, what? So, that means. Um, <coughs> yes, exactly. Uh, no. Exactly. So, since V is connected, right? So, what does that mean? So the places where it is so it's 0 is a closed set where it's 1 is a closed set and it can't be you know and they will form a disconnection therefore you will get that uh, is um, is identically 0 or identically one. Okay. Now that should uh, do the job. Let's see. Um, Okay, now let's go back to our uh, Okay. So now let's evaluate it at v. Look back here. Exactly. Exactly. So now look at this. Right? So you know that for every so Given a psi, there is only one chi such that it is 1 and it is 0 elsewhere. So, conclude given chi, there exactly there exists. So, f, f chi psi is for one for a, a single chi and uh, zero for the rest. Okay. Now are we done? I believe we should be done. Let's see. Um, what does that mean? Let's look at this phi v g. Right. Now I want to say that phi v is constant. Right. So I want to say that phi v of g is constant. As you know, for as I vary v for any fixed g, as I vary v, it is constant. Right. So to show that it is enough to show that because 
the, all the functions evaluate to the same thing. See, if all functions, so, okay, so to show, so let's claim, we have, the, I, I, I claim we have proved the theorem is proved, okay, <laughs> but then I have to show you why the theorem is proved, okay. So, um, okay, this proves that uh, uh, phi is constant, okay, why? So here is the explanation. So to show phi v g is equal to phi v prime g, right, for all g, enough to show that uh, pullbacks of phi v and phi v prime are the same enough to show that phi v uh, chi or psi is equal to psi phi v prime for all psi Yes. And then now you're saying you fix a g. Yes. Uh, you want to or okay. So if you have a direct argument, why don't you say it? Maybe you maybe that's correct. Maybe I'm getting confused. Why don't you say it? Yeah, so instead of looking at v cross g to h bar, yeah. Let's look at the the other one, k h to k v tensor k g. Yes. And then uh, you want to say so here you're saying you fix a g, what happens to when you vary v? Yeah. Instead of that, you want to look at this map, yes. So, chi goes to? Uh, it goes to some, some So, what I had was f chi. F chi. Ah, so, the, so, okay, psi goes to chi, some chi. Yes, one tensor. It's a one tensor chi, yes. Indeed, it was one tensor chi, right. And now, uh, uh, now when, when you fix a g, hmm. uh, as you vary v, uh, this thing doesn't change. I mean, now, right now, I'm looking only at the characters in KH. Yes. Uh, so this this will be independent of once you have fixed a G, it will be independent of uh, the V, right? One six yes. I mean, Correct. once you fix a G, that chi gets fixed. Yes. I mean, if you look at KG, yes. that chi is fixed. That chi depends on. Ex absolutely, I I I agree with what you're saying intuitively. If all of us agree, I have no problem. Okay, so correct. So what this is saying is that psi gets pulled back to chi under no matter what the v you choose. No matter what the v you choose. Therefore, all of them must be the same. All homomorphisms must be the same. That's the. So that's what I've written here. That this. I mean, I'm afraid this is the kind of thing that uh, uh, no matter how much I is, yeah, so. I'm not very good at. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of thing that each of one of us should just sort of do it and all agree upon that we all, this is correct rather than. <laughs> I trying to convince you of something. OK? 
Okay. So what I could try to do is uh, I'll try to see if there is a mm, way to write it, which is um, maybe a little more illuminating. The book is uh, cryptic. What I have said here may also be quite cryptic. Um, so if I find that, I will uh, mail that to you. Okay. So the next thing in chapter 3 is, uh, there, there is just a little more in chapter 3. Uh, and then we will be, we are done, we can go on to chapter 4. On Friday I am not in town, so I am unable to, there is no class, I will send out a mail also. There is no class on Friday. We meet next Wednesday then. Can we meet some other time? Can you meet any? Can we meet any? No, you would rather not, okay. No, next Friday we have We'll meet next Friday anyway, and Friday afternoon is the exam, right? That's what we said. Friday morning will be class and Friday afternoon. Ah, yes. So wh whatever we'll cover on Friday will not be part of the class, don't worry. So let's say up to here, up to this uh, rigidity, uh, there is a little bit more which I'll, um, I mean, that will take maybe just 15, 20 minutes to cover. So we'll be done with, we are essentially done with chapter three. Okay. So it is up to here that is covered in the exam. No matter what we do on the next two days, never mind. Up to here is what is in the exam. Okay, let's decide it. So next week, uh, what should we do? Um, can we have uh, somehow one more class? Is it possible? Can we have three Thursday? Huh? Can we have three classes the week after that? Then? The week after that is really a problem because uh, the week after that and the week after that uh, we'll have some lectures in representation we have a visitor uh, who is giving quite a few six lectures so it's going to be really tough huh? okay um, how about on thursday the day before the mitzvah yeah you have a I mean, you're going, you don't have an exam or anything, no? Okay, but you, there is the lecture for you. <laughs> so, uh, but you are there on Friday. Oh, but you're going away and coming back. Oh, I see. Okay. So, well, I will send out a mail. Is uh, Thursday a possibility? Um, so, so, because again, the week after that, Bakri apparently is a holiday, which is a Wednesday. So we are really getting into, uh, and that those two weeks are really tight because uh, we have a visitor here. Um, okay, um, I will send out a mail in any case. I know it is uh, not pleasant to, you know, have a have to somehow uh, push in more classes, but uh, let me just take a look and if I really need to do, I will, I will. if not, uh, then um, the week after that, that is, uh, if somehow it doesn't work out, then uh, towards the end of October, we will have uh, more classes. Okay, somehow, whether on the Thursday slot or on Friday, you know, somehow we'll get in more classes. Okay, okay, so no class on Friday, and uh, of course, we could meet uh, tomorrow. Is tomorrow? No, tomorrow is, okay, sorry, tomorrow is not. Okay, okay.
So, no class Friday and uh, we meet next uh, Thursday possibly, Friday for sure and I will send out. Okay. Fr Friday for sure, no need for, uh, that is, uh, goes without saying. If it is Thursday, I will do send out. If there is no mail, that means there is no class. Okay, and for this Friday, I will send out a mail. There is no class in any case. I'm not in town. 